Hello, and thanks for listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and I'm going to talk in this presentation about some of the ideas in uh, the book Understanding Beliefs by Nils J. Nielsen. The first thing I would say is that if I were to say what I think Nielsen's purpose in this book is, like why is he writing this book called Understanding Beliefs, I think it's because he wants to uh, enable us to have a better sense of what's going on in our own heads and why in order that we can be more uh, in control, more active, more conscious about the way we think and interpret the world around us. That's why at the beginning of the book, in the preface, Nilsson makes a difference, a differentiation between knowing something and believing something. And in fact, he says that he really doesn't when we say, I know something, I know this is true, he says that's really a belief that's extremely strong. You believe it very, very strongly, so strongly that it's almost impossible for it, that belief to be dislodged from your mind. And the reason why he does this is not necessarily to make us unsure of our beliefs, but rather to make us aware of the limitations that we as humans have because of our limited perspective, our uh, limitation to certain forms of sensory input, that really what we can know absolutely is very limited. There's some that go so far, there's a, there's a particular philosophical stance known as solipsism, which is, means only the self, that holds really the only thing that you can know for sure is that you're experiencing something. You know that you're experiencing what you see and hear and feel and smell, but you actually don't even know if what you're experiencing is real. You just know that you are experiencing it. So in some sense, it's a very radical form of skeptic skepticism that says everything that we think is true, everything that we believe, everything that we supposedly know to be true, we actually can't know it for certain. There is some limitation. And I think that's true. Although, as I stated in class, um, we don't necessarily, just because we acknowledge that there is that ultimate limit, that's not necessarily something that we take with us in a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in day-to-day -day lives, that we're always saying, well, I don't really know. I don't know any of this for sure. This could all be an illusion. It's not that we live in that uh, mindset. It'd be impossible to do so but rather that we just be aware of those limitations because when we're not aware of our limitations, when we assume, I know this, it's definitely true, there's no way it could be not true, and we refuse to uh, question any of our, our supposed knowledge, our beliefs, that's when problems occur. That's when we start to um, make false assumptions. That's when we start to overlook evidence. And that's also when we start to get combative and argumentative and perhaps even hostile to others who don't share our beliefs. The perfect example or the, the uh, best uh, description of this limitation I think comes at the end of chapter one when he talks about the virtual reality that we all live in. That is, our brains, uh, our bodies uh, receive all these sensory impressions, vision, um, touch, uh, smells, etc. And our bodies have these receptors, our eyes, our nose, our, our ears, that react to external stimulus. And then our brain takes those reactions and constructs a model of reality around us. As I talked about in class, in a sense, it's like we're looking at a computer screen or a TV screen, and everything that we're seeing is being broadcast to us. We really don't see or hear or feel the outside world we, our brain experiences or recreates a, uh, a model of that, and that is what we live within. That is what our consciousness is within. And that's a very kind of freaky thing to think about because it almost makes it seem like we're these blind um, just beings floating through space uh, living in a fantasy world. Uh, but obviously there's some reason. There's some legitimacy to the illusions, to the virtual reality that we have, because it enables us to function in the world. If it was complete nonsense, then none of us would survive, right? If we if we looked at the world around us and we thought we saw land when it was really water, then we'd drown, et cetera, et cetera. You get what I'm saying here is that, you know, even though the 
the reality that our brain constructs is not complete. It's not accurate. It's not the world as it actually is, if we could even imagine such a thing, right? We don't see all spectrums of light. We can't hear all uh, 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 tones. There are some tones that are too high for us to hear, etc. But even though we don't see a complete reality, we do see some model of reality that allows us to function and exist as living beings and interact with each other. So there is a practical value to it. We might say, in fact, that, that uh, the fact that we can believe and hold beliefs and, and hold beliefs over long periods of time, that is, a belief is something that's not just you know it at that instant, but it's something that carries with you, um, it's, it seems to be there's an evolutionary purpose for that. Beliefs are essential for us to function in the world. If we had no beliefs, if we had no knowledge or understanding or models of the world around us, we'd be essentially like infants, infants who are just um, overwhelmed by the masses of sensory stimuli that are coming in that mean really nothing to the child, to an infant, because an infant hasn't learned how to construct a virtual reality out of all these sensory inputs. So beliefs, and when, I, when I'm talking here about beliefs, I'm talking about very, very basic beliefs, beliefs that we almost wouldn't even count as a declarative knowledge, something that you wouldn't necessarily state, like, I believe if I step off uh, a ledge, I'll fall down. You wouldn't necessarily even state that as a belief. It just seems so common sense and obvious. But these systems of beliefs that we develop, um, they allow us to function on a day-to-day -day basis. This is, uh, Nilsson talks about the idea of fast thinking versus slow thinking. So fast thinking is how our brain uses um, just our, our sort of baseline beliefs, our understanding of the world and how people behave and, and how the, the laws of nature operate, et cetera, et cetera. That allows us to make our routine daily decisions. You see someone coming towards you and they have a certain look on their face and you believe, ah, that look is a dangerous look, that's a scary look, they're angry, so I'm gonna walk to the other side of the street or I'm gonna run away from this person. Or you see something that's, um, uh, uh, you see a fire and you believe fire burns, so I'm not going to touch the fire, right? Very basic things where we're not really even thinking consciously. We're just reacting. There are these belief systems um, that, again, are almost programmed in on a behavioral level, on a subconscious level, and that's how we are able to function on a day-to-day -day basis and navigate the world around us. There's also, of course, the slower thinking because sometimes those initial reactions that we have are incorrect. We mistake a shadow, uh, we think it's a, a monster, right? Something like that. If you're a child, you see a shadow in your room, you think it's a monster. You learn later, oh, that's not, that's not true. Let me evaluate that belief. Let me think through this more carefully. Um, and you're able to revise your belief. So slow thinking is a way uh, to work through one's beliefs more consciously, to work through them uh, by act actively perceiving judging what your goal is, determining what your goal is, and identifying the proper course of action. So beliefs, both on an instinctual level and on a more conscious, rational level, help us to navigate the world around us, to understand how we should act, how others are going to act, etc. Beliefs also help us to understand what's going on around us, what we observe. So for example, even if it's not something in which you're involved in directly, but we have certain beliefs about, for example, uh, political parties. So even if you're not necessarily um, following a political story too closely, because you have certain beliefs about Republicans or Democrats, you're going to explain what's happening through those systems of beliefs. So we use, and these beliefs are, are based often on our previous experiences. They're based on um, what we've heard from others, the kinds of information that we've been told and taken in. Um, so, but we use these beliefs to kind of explain larger phenomena. And this also, unfortunately, is where one of the most dangerous aspects of our uh, belief system and the way humans, the way our brains work and the way psychologically we, we uh, function according to our belief systems. Um, we be our beliefs are also something to make us feel comfortable. Beliefs help us by giving us a certain sense of control, a certain sense of permanence, a certain sense of understanding. 
Um, one of the most powerful beliefs for many people is their belief in their religious faith, their belief in, in the afterlife or the divine, whatever it might be. Um, now, of course, there's really no way to prove any of these. By definition, the divine is outside of the realm of our experience. This isn't to say you shouldn't believe in a god or whatever, but it's something that we have to, by its very nature, we have to take on faith. The kinds of evidence that, for example, scientists require to verify their hypotheses and, and theories, uh, there is no sort of evidence like that for any religion, regardless of, of what it is. So all religions are taken on faith. And one of the most important things about religion um, as a belief system is the way it gives people a sense of meaning. For many people, without the idea of an afterlife or without the idea of a god, life seems meaningless or life seems purposeless or just confusing and strange and too difficult. But belief in an afterlife gives many people a sense of purpose, gives many people a sense of meaning. Belief in a God that wants you to do good gives people a sense of, uh, uh, again, a sense of purpose. And it makes people feel like the world around them has meaning. And even despite any of the sufferings um, in that we have, uh, that there is still a purpose to it, that there is some good behind it. And that's all wonderful. That's one of the, the best things about religious belief is the way it brings people together and the way it gives people a sense of, of meaning and purpose to do good. But religious beliefs or any beliefs become uh, uh, problematic when they become so rigid that they don't allow any deviance and they start to um, affect the way you interact with others. So for example, I can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I can believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and you have to, and, you, and then I have to put my faith in Jesus in order to be saved. I can believe that Jesus wants me to do good and help others. That's all fine. But then when I start to believe, because I believe in Jesus and this other person doesn't, the other person is bad, that's when the beliefs start to become problematic. And that is a, a, a way of feeling comfort. That is, a, in a sense, of the belief being beneficial to you. It makes you feel better than others. I'm better than this other person because I believe in God and they don't, or they believe in the wrong God, or they practice the wrong way. These sorts of beliefs, uh, and what I would say is beliefs about other people, our beliefs about other people are the most dangerous to become rigid and inflexible and thus become discriminatory and, and even cause conflict and hostility. White supremacists believe certain things about people who are not white, and they refuse to consider any alternative to that belief. They will exclude any evidence that challenges that. So if, if a white supremacist believes that African-American people are inferior mentally, et cetera, et cetera, they're not going to care about African Americans who are uh, who have uh, won awards for their academic achievements. It's not going to not going to admit that as evidence. It's going to discount that, even though it's there, but it conflicts with their belief system. So when your beliefs start to conflict with the experiences around you, and again, especially when it's beliefs about other people, and you have these rigid beliefs about the way a woman should be, the way um, the way a man should be the proper position of, of uh, different races, all these sorts of things, that's when um, the belief systems become so rigid and they give, you, they give one a kind of sense of superiority, of self-importance, but they become a trap. They become a way not to navigate the world, but in fact a way to trap ourselves within a limitation that only causes problems. In the third chapter, where do beliefs come from? Nilsson talks about where beliefs come from. Um, and they come from a number of different places. Of course, one of the most, uh, uh, th the most direct way our beliefs come to us is through our own experiences. The example of the child who touches something hot, is burned by it, learns, oh, these things are hot, I shouldn't touch them. He calls that a belief, even though, again, it's not necessarily something that we would um, write out as, as part of our motto, a part of something we believe, we just consider it 
uh, a basic, almost instinctual knowledge, but it is something that is learned. It's not something that we know instinctively. We have to learn it. We have to come to believe that touching something hot will burn us. So our beliefs come from our own experiences. But what's the problem there? Well, we know our perceptions are faulty. For example, something if you look at someone who's 100 feet away, they look very small. As they move closer, they appear to get bigger. Of course, they're the same size, right? We know that. Um, but our senses tell us that the person is very small and when they get closer that they've grown. Our minds just know because we know that that's not, we've, we've learned that, that people don't actually change size. We don't get confused by that. But there are other ways in which our perspectives and the limitations of our senses have, uh, 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 can shape our beliefs. For example, the belief that the sun revolves around the earth. From our perspective, it looks like the sun re revolves around the earth. That is what we see. That is the only uh, uh, information that we get through our senses. But when we start to observe other things and start to make measurements, then we learn, ah, actually our perceptions are false. What we thought was true, what we thought we knew, what we believed to be true, was in fact a misbelief, an incorrect belief, a belief uh, tainted by the limitations of our own perspectives. Now something that Nilsson leaves out that I think is extremely important in terms of thinking about where our beliefs come from is identity. Identity in terms of the way we identify ourselves, who you think you are, who we think we are as people. In our modern world, there are a number of different axes of identity. There are a number of different categories of identity that we use to differentiate ourselves from others as well as to group ourselves with others. So for example, there's gender, male or female, um, or rather masculine or feminine. There's sex, sexuality, race, um, social class, economic status, nationality, all these different things, religion, um, political party, uh, uh, where you're from, what part of the, the state you're from, what part of the country you're from, are you a northerner or a southerner, right? There's almost an infinite number of different types of identities that we can occupy and that make us up as individuals. Any one person could say, I'm a man, I'm straight, I'm an American, I'm a Christian, I'm a middle class person, I'm a Democrat, I'm a et cetera, et cetera. These are all parts of their identity. And when we, our identities are how, again, as I said, how we identify ourselves and how we identify with others. And identity is, I think, one of the most important sources, and again, one of the most dangerous, in a certain sense, sources of belief. Some of the first things we learn as children are who we are and what makes us different from other people. And part of that sense of self, sense of identity, uh, who you identify with, who you are identical to, as well as who you are different from, a big part of identity is what you believe. We're Americans, so we believe in freedom. We believe in liberty, justice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We believe all men are created equal, right? If you are born an American, you are told that's what you believe, and you believe it. You don't really have a choice, uh, at least as a child. You may change over time, but these are the beliefs that you're put in, that are put into your mind initially. And so we might think about all the different identities that are uh, uh, that we adopt and that we start to, in, in a certain sense, are placed upon us uh, at an early age from childhood on. You're taught that you're an American or whatever nationality. You're taught that you're a Christian, and with that comes a certain set of beliefs. You're taught that you're a man or a woman, and with that comes a certain set of beliefs and ways of looking at the world. You're taught that your parents are conservative or liberal or progressive or whatever they might be, and so that comes with a certain set of beliefs about the world, the way the world works. And we often get sort of confused about this. Um, there's a sort of chicken and egg problem. I had a student once who was a rancher. His, family's, his family were ranchers. And he said, well, my belief in the, the 
ethics of ranching, I, I believe that it's ethical to uh, raise animals, uh, raise uh, cows and such, and um, uh, slaughter them for meat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's based in my biblical beliefs, in my faith. And I said, so you read the Bible and then, after reading it, decided to become a rancher? Well, no, obviously that's not what happened. He was told when he was born, he was told all growing up by his parents and family, we are ranchers, this is what we believe, we're also Christians, this is what we believe, and those beliefs go together. Right? He was taught to believe that. He didn't come to that belief. It was something that was already embedded in him from childhood. And it's like that with all of us. Because, of course, there will be other people who would say, well, my Christian faith tells me that it's immoral, it's unethical to slaughter animals. But really, in both, in both cases, in some sense, the beliefs are always after the fact. We construct our beliefs um, after, afterwards, secondarily to who we are and to our place in the world. A good analogy I like to use is the Jason Bourne movies. If you've seen any of the Jason Bourne movies, like The Bourne Supremacy, The Bourne Ultimatum, etc., the plot is Jason Bourne is a super highly trained special agent. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, trained in weaponry. He's trained in, in hand-to-hand combat. He's just a total badass. Um, and at the beginning of the movie, he's somehow lost his memory. So he wakes up. He doesn't know who he is. But he knows, you know, he knows the world around him. He, under- he knows what a car is. He knows what year it is, all that sort of thing. Um, but he doesn't know who he is or what his place is in the world. And then he realizes he has all these skills that he doesn't even know where they came from. Someone tries to attack him, and all of a sudden he busts out all these kung fu moves and is able to, to fight off five people. He has no idea how he learned that. Where did that, where did that ability come from? And he sort of, as the movies go on, he's trying to figure out who he is, trying to find his place, understand why do I know these things? How do I know these things? What am I supposed to do with my abilities? And in a sense, we're all in that same position. We're all kind of waking up every day into a world in which all sorts of things we already know and believe, and we don't even know where those beliefs came from, where that knowledge came from. Can you remember what it was like before you knew how to read? Can you remember what it was like before you were, if you're a Christian, can you remember what it was like before you were Christian? Well, probably not, because you went from being nothing, being an infant with no beliefs whatsoever, and you were just made a Christian. Those beliefs were poured into you. So identity is a very big part of our beliefs. We, We believe certain things because that's who we are. That's who we're told to be. And, of course, this is where prejudice, discrimination, hatred comes from. I believe something because I'm white. I believe this about black people because I'm white and they're black. And where does that come from? Very rarely do those sorts of beliefs come from actual experience. If they do, it's from very limited experience. It's because you're told as a child, we're white. This is what it's like to be a white person. This is what it means to be white. This is what black people are like. This is what it means to be a black person. This is what it means to be a Latino or Latina. This is what it means to be et cetera, et cetera, right? We're given these beliefs, and because of the way, because our identities are so important to us, we want to know who we are. We want to know our place in the world, right? Jason Bourne wants to know who he is. He's not just going to say, well, I know how to do all these badass things, but I don't know who I am. I'll just try to live my life. We all need a place, and we need to know who we are and how to relate to those around us. So our identity beliefs are, in, a s- in much the same way that, our, that, are, that religious beliefs, they are beliefs that are consolatory. They are beliefs that make us happy or that give us a sense of confidence in self. But when they become rigid and dogmatic and inflexible, then these sorts of beliefs uh, cause conflicts. The person who believes that all Muslims are terrorist, are terrorists, no matter what evidence, no matter the fact of all the millions of Muslims living in the world who aren't terrorists, someone says, I know what they are, I know Muslims are terrorists because that's what I've seen, that's who they are as people, that's what I believe, so I'm going to refuse to change my view. And that's the kind of rigidity that creates hatred, that creates discrimination. 
And it is a false belief. It's an incorrect belief because it is, as we've talked about in class, um, a misuse of inductive logic. It's taking a few minor examples, usually out of context, and again, also from the limited perspective of the individual, from the limited perspective of, of your soul experience, and taking those examples and charting a full belief system out of it. Now again, to some extent, we cannot help but make judgments about other people and judgments about the world around us. We can't help but um, starting to uh, group people together. We see people who look alike or who act a certain way or do certain things, and so we associate them together. We can't help but do that. What we need to be aware of, though, again, is always the limitations of our knowledge, the limitations of what we are experiencing, the limitations of the belief systems that we have that enable us to make these judgments about the world. We're always limited by our own experiences. We're always limited by our own perspective. So when we take our beliefs to be wholly, and, and there are some beliefs that we may never want to, to give up. You may never want to give up the belief in a God, and that's fine. The problematic belief is if you believe, you never want to believe that other people who don't believe in your God are evil. If you refuse to, to, to let go of that, that's when the belief becomes a problem and starts to cause uh, uh, damage. So I'll end this uh, short presentation on the first three chapters of Understanding Beliefs by asking you to consider what is your identity? How do you identify yourself? Do you identify yourself as a man, a woman, a Christian, uh, a Muslim, a Jew, uh, straight, gay, bisexual, uh, non-binary, um, uh, uh, an American, a Hispanic, a Mexican? Um, do you identify yourself as a northerner, a southerner, a Texan, a Javelina, right? All these different categories of, of identity that you have, and think about what are the beliefs that you have that are tied up with those identities? Because you identify yourself as straight, for example, what are the consequences of that belief and that perspective on the world? What are the consequences um, what are, because of your religion? If you've been uh, raised in a certain religion, what are the beliefs that you have as a consequence of that? And in what ways are those beliefs tied to your sense of self, sense of identity? And think about what are the beliefs that I don't want to admit? What are the ideas that maybe challenge my sense of self, that challenge my perspective as a white man or as an African-American woman or as a um, American atheist, whatever it might be? Because in my opinion, what I believe is that it's at those margins of our identity where our beliefs most need questioning. It's not so, I don't, you know, it's not so much our scientific beliefs or things like that, but the beliefs that we have based on who we think we are. Because you may identify yourself as a white man or as an African-American woman or straight, but you're so much more than all those things. In a certain sense, our identities are limiting to us. They limit us to a certain segment. They limit us to a certain perspective. They limit us to a certain, to associating with only certain people and communicating and understanding certain people. But we are all much more than men, women. We're more than our sexuality. We're more than our nationality. So think about where your identity maybe causes you to shut down rational thought. In our modern world, the biggest area is politics, right? People who are Republicans don't want to listen to Democrats. People who are Democrats don't want to listen to Republicans. And no matter what for many people, no matter what someone who is a Republican or someone who is a Democrat says, they could be saying something that you agree with 100% normally, but because it's being said by someone who is different, someone who's of a different identity, you say, I don't believe that. That's wrong. This is what I believe. So think about what are the identities that, that you try to protect most, that in a certain sense that are most anxious and that limit your ways of thinking and that force you into certain belief traps that maybe don't recognize, that, that, that limit you from really understanding the world around you and really learning and being open to new experiences. 
Uh, with that said, I will end this short presentation on the first part of Understanding Beliefs. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to email. Um, otherwise, I will see you at the next presentation. Thank you, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Take care.